I always begin, as many of us I'm sure do, with the dua. رَبِّ اشْرَحْ لِي صَدْرِي وَيَسْتِرْ لِي أَمْرِي وَحْلَ الْعُقْدَةُ مِنْ لِسَانِ يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِي When we are speaking to our children, when we are speaking to our preteens, our teenagers, our young adults and our adult children, we need to begin with this dua. Because we need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help in being able to connect with our children. In being able to speak to them in a way that they will understand in being able to listen to them in the way that we will understand. When we speak about our youth today, when we speak about our children, many times we'll hear in the masajid, in conferences, in programs, by well-meaning imams and leaders and speakers, we will hear that we have a crisis in our youth, that our youth are facing a crisis, that there is a crisis. Many times this crisis will be labeled as a crisis of faith or as a crisis of adab, a crisis of character. But the reality is that when we look at our youth today, when we look at our children, when we look at our families, the crisis we are facing is a crisis of communication. It's a crisis of addiction where our children and us as parents have become so consumed with the technology that rules our lives that we no longer can communicate face to face. Instead, a child may be downstairs in the living room and a parent upstairs, and rather than shouting down to the child, or rather than the child shouting up to the parent, they send a text. We do this with our spouses as well quite frequently. And this is where the breakdown in our interactions begins. But it's not where it ends. Whenever I do smaller workshops on the topic of communication, I often start with an exercise. And I will ask everyone to stand and to raise up one hand. And as I continue with the exercise, I will continue to ask people to do certain things. Place their hand on their head, put it on their shoulders, place it on their knees, place their hands on their hips. And then I will verbally say, place your hand on your chin as I put my own hand on my cheek. And many times as I look around the room, a large percentage of the people in the room will have their hand on their chin not their cheek. And another group of people will have their hands on their cheek and not their chin. And so I always ask, what is it? What motivated those people? Even though I said chin, why would they put their hand on their cheek? And the response is because I put my hand on my cheek. And we see how the visual action overtakes the verbal. So that even though I may say something, what the people react to is what they see. Our children are no different. They will react to our nonverbal communication just as much, if not more, than to our verbal communication. If our children come home from school and enter our cars and we ask them, how are you doing, how was your day? And they say, fine. Our response is always like, okay, good, and we move on. But did we really listen in that moment? Or if they, we ask them how was school and they say fine and we're looking at our phone and we're texting, in that moment they know that our body language, our nonverbal, is saying we don't really care. Because they will look to our nonverbals, they will look to our actions. How many times have we been in conversation with someone and before they even ask, how are you doing? We say, Alhamdulillah. Salam alaikum, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> because many times we don't listen. We have our response ready. We're so eager to be heard, we don't take the time to hear. And we do this with our children. We do this frequently with our children. If we want our children to listen to us, 
we must first listen to them. If we want our children to understand us, we must first understand them. As a high school teacher and as a mother of two teenagers myself, I know I'm constantly trying to keep up with the language. So I'm Googling all the time, what does on fleek mean? What does it mean when something's ratchet? For the longest time when I would hear someone say like, oh, that, that outfit's ratchet, I'd be like, oh, thanks, you too. <laughs> not realizing that ratchet does not mean what I thought it meant. Or now it's, oh, that's so extra, that's extra. And the language constantly changes. Why? Because it's the code for the generation. You know, in many of the marriage talks that I give, I'll often speak about the verse in Surah Al-Rum that's known as the marriage verse. The verse that reminds us to incorporate mawadda wa rahma in our interactions. But when we look at the verse that follows verse 21 in Surah Al-Rum, when we look at verse 22, we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminding us that we have been created with a diversity of tongues. And the word lisan is used. Lisan is very different than languages. And although sometimes you will look at the translation of that verse and you'll see the word language is used, the word lisan means tongue. Why tongue instead of language? All of us sitting in this room here may say, well, we all speak English, right? But when we begin to converse with our teenagers, when we begin to converse with our children, suddenly we're hearing things like LOL and uh, OMA and uh, BIO and lots of small acronyms for things that we have to stop and say, wait, is that even English? It's the same language, but it's a different tongue. I remember the first time I heard my youngest daughter, she was walking around the house uh, saying, OMA, OMA. And I ran to urbandictionary.com, and I've mentioned this in several of my talks, that it's a beautiful website that kind of guides you to the lingo of today. And I logged in and I put in OMA, and nothing came up. And I'm like, what is this OMA? So I went to my youngest daughter and I asked her, what's OMA? And she was like, Mama, it's oh my Allah. Everybody's saying it. <laughs> and I realized that even at that young of an age, there is a sort of code that is shared among youth, among our children. And it's a code that sometimes we cannot be privy to because language is powerful. The words we choose can shape our world. The theory of sociolinguistic relativity tells us that an action or an item does not gain its meaning inherently, but instead it ab adopts its meaning from the words we use to describe it. What does that mean? 20 years ago, when I was younger and you know, playing on the playground in my public school, we used to sing a song. And the song used to say something like, I'm so gay, I'm so happy today. The word had a very different connotation the word gay. Today, imagine if you fast forward and you see young people, children, playing on a playground and saying, I'm so gay, I'm so happy today. The meaning is very, very different. Among our youth today, as our seniors in the high school where I teach are filling out their college applications, this year is the first year that we find on the college application, there are three boxes under gender, male, female, other. Language is powerful. Today, when we are filling out forms again for our high school students, we are required to indicate whether someone is cisgendered or transgendered. What is cisgendered? It's a word that has just come into our lexicon recently. And it's a word to identify someone who is born adhering to a specific biological gender and who also identifies with that biological gender. So it means if you are born a boy, you are a boy. If you're born a girl, you are a girl. But why do we need a term now, cisgendered, to describe it? Because this is how we normalize what may seem outside the range of normal. When we label what is normally accepted 
in a regular sense of the term, we begin to create an avenue for labeling other items as well. This is what our children are facing today. And yet we speak to our children in our tongues. We speak to them in languages that we've grown up with. And I don't mean to say that these languages are Urdu or Arabic or Spanish or French. Yes, that's a part of it. We bring our cultural baggage or our cultural background into our relationship with our children. But we speak to them in a language that describes our generation, describes what we grew up with, rather than what they're experiencing. If I tell all of you right now to think of a tree, and in this moment, each of you conjure up in your mind an image of a tree, I can guarantee that around this room, we will have at least 10, 20, 30, maybe even different types of trees that you thought of. Some of you may have thought of a palm tree. Some of you may have thought of a Christmas tree. Some of you may have thought of an oak tree. Some of you may have thought of a willow tree. Regardless of what tree you thought of, the word that I said was tree. And the tree that I was thinking of was an apple tree. But when I conveyed that word to you, you brought to your understanding of it your own background your own history, your own memories, your own thought processes, your own world views. And in bringing together your background, your worldview, your history, your knowledge, you saw a tree that was very different from the tree that I wanted to convey. So imagine now when we speak to our children who are growing up in a world that may have many different things going on in it than what we experienced. How do we reach them? How do we get them to understand us and we understand them? The first step is by recognizing that each generation will always have a different version of the song that we had when we were growing up. Parents just don't understand. This is part of Sunnat al haya that as we grow older, we look back at our own parents and we think, wow, we really gave them a run for their money. And our children will get to that point as well. I remember when I was growing up, again, I'm kind of giving away my age here, but back in the 80s, Michael Jackson was very big. And he had a song back then called Bad. And it was really cool that anything that was good, anything that was fun, anything that you liked, you'd be like, that's bad, that's bad. And so my sisters and I would walk around and everything was bad. We'd be like, oh, that's so bad. That's so bad. And it would drive my parents crazy because they'd say, if you like something, say it's good. If you don't like something, then say it's bad. And in our minds, we would just kind of shake our heads and say, parents don't understand. And this is the process, recognizing that we will not always be privy to the conversations of our teens and our children we won't always be allowed entrance into that secret realm. But we do have to understand it. And we do have to understand the avenues that we can follow and pursue to connect with our children. And it's not always by using the same words. Because I know I embarrass my teenagers all the time when I'm speaking to their friends and I'm like, oh, that's so on fleek, or like, yeah, that's extra. And they're like, mom, don't, like, just don't. <laughs> So it's not about us adopting their language and utilizing it. It's about us listening. It's about being able to really hear our children when they speak to us. And to hear them not just with our ears, but to show them that we are interested in what they have to say, to connect with them with our eyes, to drop our devices to put down the phone, and to really listen to them, to be present, to have them see that we are interested in their lives. We want to know what's going on. We want to have that connection with them because that's the foundation. Our children will enter into a world that will consistently try to highlight for them that they are different, 
They will enter into a world where people will tell them they're not good enough, they're not smart enough, they're not pretty enough, they're not thin enough, they're not good enough. Our children need to be able to come home to a place of security where they can know and they can hear consistently that they are more than good enough, that they are more than pretty, that they are more than everything the world tells them. And we can only give that to our children when we learn how to connect with them, when we learn how to speak to them. Where does it begin? It begins with our own communication. How do we speak to our spouse? How do we speak to our own parents? When our children see us interacting as a family, do they know mom's the easy one and dad's the tough one? Do they think, well, I can talk to this parent, but I can't talk to that parent? When they see us interacting with our own parents, how do we communicate with them? If we communicate at all, do we call them? Do we speak to them? Are we kind to them? Because our children will emulate those actions. Our children will look for the communication cues that they learn from us, from who we are and how we interact. And they will co-opt that into their lives. Talk to your children. If your child is a texter, reach out through text and tell them that you love them. Tell them that you are proud of them. Tell them that they're amazing. But even better than that, tell them to put their phone down. Tell them to come sit next to you. Tell them that you enjoy their company and you want to be with them. And don't just tell them, show them. Be the parent who goes on the field trip with the children. Be the parent who drives the children to soccer practice. Be the parent who sits through the presentations and the programs. Be the parent who is there. Because when you're the parent who's there for the children at a young age, your children will be there when you grow older. And not because they have to, but because they want to. Because you've built that connection with them brick by brick, step by step. You've built it through your connections of communication. You've built it by being able to speak to them. You've built it by knowing that they, when you speak, they will listen. Because when they speak, you also will listen. We're living in the age of information where our children are bombarded. They're bombarded with images, with social media, with different uh, chat groups online, with things they watch on YouTube, with television shows. They are bombarded every which way. We are living in an age where Hollywood in particular tries to teach our children to do you, to be your own person, to be yourself. And implicit in those messages of doing you and being your own person is a thin thread. A thread of you do you, and it doesn't matter what your parents think. And we know, of course, the importance of the relationship between parent and child. We know in the Quran we are reminded consistently in the verses in the Quran when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about shirk, speaks about the biggest sin possible, those verses are frequently followed with the importance of being good and kind to parents, the importance of lowering the wing of humility to your parents. But it's a two-way street. Respect is reciprocal. Our children will respect us when we show them that respect as well. And what does it mean to respect our children? It doesn't mean to give in to their whims, to buy them every latest new Xbox game, to purchase devices left and right. That's not what it means. It means to listen. It means to understand. It means to try to connect with them 
in a tongue that they can comprehend. How do we achieve that? Again, it's not by trying to co-opt their language. It's not by trying to speak in the way that they speak. It's in learning the code for ourselves, in understanding for ourselves what it is that they're saying, but even more than that, what it is that they're going through. When our youth speak to us about things like K2 or spice, know that they're not speaking about a new Dunkin' Donuts flavor or some kind of candy. Know that these are synthetic drugs that are being used in high schools around the country. When our kids begin to talk about or show interest in the legalization of marijuana, talk to them. Don't shy away from these hard subjects. It used to be that we were afraid when our kids would ask a question like, Mom, Dad, where do babies come from? Those are the easy questions now. Instead, we have youth, children as young as elementary school, asking, Mom, Dad, how come my friend Katie has two moms? Mom, Dad, how come this person has the boy's name but looks like a girl? Mom, Dad, how come in the bathroom, in school now, boys who feel like they're girls can use the same bathroom as me? These are real questions, and they're questions that we need to educate ourselves on so that we can have those conversations. This is how we speak in the same tongue. It's by understanding the power of language and understanding the power of the nonverbal as well and being able to connect with our children because we understand, because we are aware, because we recognize what is happening in the world. In our counseling center, we see a lot of teens who have suffered deep emotional trauma because of catfishing. And I've mentioned this term Frequently, and I'll continue to mention it in my sessions because I don't think there is enough awareness that surrounds catfishing and what it is. But many of our teens are lonely. They are looking for someone to speak to. Why? Because as parents, we may not be affording them the supportive atmosphere, not only to speak to us, because our children will not tell us everything, but to also create that dynamic space where they have friends, companions, who have the adab, the akhlaq, the iman that we want to inculcate in them. And if we are not giving them that supportive atmosphere, then guess what? They will find it. And they will find it in all of the wrong places. And they will go online and they will latch on to the first person that tells them, you look cute in this picture. I like your tweets. I think you're deep. You're so extra. And when they latch on to that person, it will not matter that this may be a predator. It will not matter to them that this may be someone who has taken someone else's identity. It does not matter that this could be a pitfall, a trap, a situation of catfishing because they will be seeking someone who will listen. And so I urge you all, and the advice is for myself first and foremost, to be the one who listens, to be the one who understands, to learn the tongues of our children so that we can connect with them. Because as this generation grows, their difficulties will be very different. Their challenges will be very different than the difficulties and challenges we have, may have faced as children. But inshallah, we will be the ones that are there to understand, the ones that are there to guide them, the ones that with the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hopefully be able to lead them on the path of the most righteous, bi-iznillah. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum.